while we wait for them to fiddle with the lights, let me just say how, how absolutely thrilled I am to be here and to see so many old friends and folks who know uh, probably a lot more about China than I do, but it's great, it's great to have you here, and I, I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, to have somebody who used to work for UPI introduce me is especially meaningful because when I was in Beijing, Open as an open the CNN Beijing bureau. We had a kind of, back then it was still known as sort of chicken noodle news. It wasn't the global <laughs> colossus that it is today. And so CNN and UPI had a kind of uh, alliance. We were the sort of underdog news agencies, and we essentially operated as kind of one bureau, especially during 1989. So I have a real soft spot for UPI. So it's especially gratifying um, that, that, Bill, that Bill is here. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the themes in the book, and uh, then we can open it up for uh, questions and discussion. And I want to begin by going back uh, quite a long time to 1973, uh, when I made my first trip to China, just one year after Richard Nixon's historic trip. That's me with the long, not gray hair and the <laughs> I went with a student group, and one of the places we were taken was the Wusan People's Commune near Shenyang. And there we met a model of Maoist peasant uh, named Yu Ke Xin. And we had lunch at his uh, modest home. And it was, in many ways, the highlight of my month long trip. Uh, 20 years later, in 1993, as CNN's first Beijing bureau chief, I decided to retrace the 1973 trip to see how the country had changed in the intervening 20 years. I managed to find Yu Kishin and track him down. And I discovered that he was now running a tractor repair shop. He lived in a new flat. He had a television set. He was clearly one of the beneficiaries of the market-oriented reforms that Deng Xiaoping had introduced um, some years before. And his life had clearly improved. But as soon as the local officials who arranged this were, were out of earshot, you confessed to me that almost everything I'd seen in that 1973 trip had been an illusion. He said, in fact, conditions back then were terrible, that it was lucky if he ate meat once a month, and that the meal I had so enjoyed had actually been trucked in by local officials the day before to impress the foreigners. So for me, this episode underscores the central theme in any discussion about the history and experiences of foreign correspondents in China. And that is the challenge of finding the truth in a vast, complicated country with a long history of distrust of outsiders and an authoritarian political system. Over the decades, reporters for the American media, in this case, the picture here is of John Pomfret, then in the AP and later Washington Post. John's here uh, with the Wu Kai Si and Wang Gan, two student leaders in Tiananmen Square in 1989. In any case, the reporters for the American media uh, have played a critical role in both influencing American views of the country as well as the policies of successive American governments. Moreover, because of the reach of US news organizations like the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, the networks, the wire services, uh, such coverage has had a district kind of a, a, a large impact beyond the states around, around the world. But for many consumers of news, the way they uh, the information they read in newspapers or uh, magazines or online or listen to on the radio or watch on television actually gets there remains a mystery. Few people understand what goes into the reporting, the writing, and the transmission of news. Yet, as I'm sure most of the journalists or former journalists in this room will acknowledge, the process decisively shapes virtually any news report. And so now, with China emerging as a global superpower and its relations with the US more strained than at any time in the last 50 years, understanding the people who've covered, the, covered China for the American media and how they've done so is a critical step to understanding the news that people are watching and reading. And providing that understanding is the central goal of Simon China. The story of the journalist in Simon China begins with the triumph of Mao Zedong's communist revolution in 1949 at which point virtually all American and other Western reporters were forced to leave the country. Indeed, when Mao proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic in Tiananmen Square on October 1st, 1949, not a single American correspondent was there to cover the event. 
For most of the three decades that followed, American reporters had little choice but to cover China from outside the mainland, most notably from the then British colony of Hong Kong. The China watchers, as they became known, relied primarily on the official Chinese media, which they monitored religiously for clues. Bernard Cal, who sadly passed away recently at the age of 100, was based in Hong Kong for the New York Times and CBS News in the late 50s and the late 60s. How do we get information about China? We got bits and pieces. We read everything we could. We put the mosaic of pieces together and try to extract some narrative about what was happening in China. But this was bits and pieces journalism. Um, it wasn't until Nixon's arrival uh, in Beijing in February of 1972 that the door began to open. At that time, China had been cut off for so long that many journalists, even such network heavyweights as Dan Rather of CBS, felt like it was going into outer space. Um, that, that, when I interviewed Barbara Walters about that trip, she said that she felt like she was going to the moon, so that was a very common sensation at the time. It, it wasn't until the U.S. and China established formal diplomatic relations in 1979 that American news organizations were allowed to open bureaus in Beijing. That's when um, Bill went there. Um, the interest in China was enormous. When Deng Xiaoping visited the U.S., the images of him wearing a cowboy hat at a rodeo in Texas cemented this idea of Deng as like the cuddly communist and China as an attractive uh, strategic and economic partner for the U.S. And the economic reforms that Deng initiated heightened this perception, which is fueled by the cascade of stories the newly arrived American journalists did about the changes underway. Jim Lorry opened the ABC News Bureau. What followed was several decades, that. were several decades when the People's Republic became increasingly accessible to American and other foreign journalists, although there were always obstacles and limitations. When I became CNN's first Beijing bureau chief in 1987, for example, the official regulations required reporters to get permission 10 days in advance for any travel outside Beijing, such as this trip I took with my crew to Tibet. Plus, reporters had to be accompanied everywhere by government minders. Moreover, contact with ordinary Chinese remained difficult. Still, Deng persisted with the reforms, which included greater engagement with the Western press. In 1986, for example, he gave an interview to Mike Wallace of CBS News, 60 Minutes. It was the first time a Chinese leader had done an on-camera interview with foreign television. But the reforming trends alarmed party officials who made repeated attempts to roll them back by periodically launching campaigns against so-called bourgeois liberalization. Dorinda Elliott, who arrived in 1986 for Newsweek, uh, tells a story about trying to interview a farmer in the countryside about one such campaign, an experience which I think gives a good sense of the challenges journalists faced then. 
The protests in Krakow and Tiananmen Square and elsewhere in 1989 uh, made that year a watershed, not only for China, but in the history of media coverage of China. It was due to an accident in history, the visit by Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. The Chinese authorities wanted extensive coverage, and so they gave permission to CNN and other broadcasters to bring in satellite dishes and other transmission equipment. But then the students literally stole the stage on which the Sino-Soviet summit was supposed to take place. The live broadcasts, and today when it's possible to transmit video live from almost anywhere by an iPhone, it's easy to lose sight of just how unprecedented such coverage was, captured attention around the world. And it presented a picture of China utterly different from the narrative the Chinese Communist Party had sought to impose on foreign journalists. But on the night of June 3rd and 4th, as you all know, the army was called in to crush the protests. The following day, from the balcony of the Beijing Hotel, the cameraman for CNN, Jonathan Scher, and a photographer for the AP, Jeff Widener, captured a moment that has become one of the iconic images of our time. The Tank Man images became a symbol of the crackdown, and the coverage from Tiananmen produced a sea change in American perceptions of China. So much so that many reporters did not initially pay enough attention when Deng Xiaoping, in 1992, with his famous Southern Tour, began to revive his program of economic reform. But American journalists swiftly shifted to chronicling the dramatic economic, social, and even political changes triggered by the boom. The new atmosphere also led to a significant improvement in working conditions. It became much easier to travel, and local officials were much more accessible. Instead of chasing them away, they often asked American correspondents for advice on how to attract foreign investment. By the late 1990s, the China beat was entering what Keith Richburg of the Washington Post described as its golden age. It was, in fact, an exhilarating period because China's economy was turning into the manufacturing hub for the world. And American journalists, were, and other foreign journalists as well, were able to dig into Chinese society in ways that had previously been difficult, if not impossible, trying to make sense of the paradoxes of a country where one day you'd be covering a jailed dissident, and the next day you'd be covering the opening of the world's largest airport. 2008 was the climax of this period when Beijing hosted the Summer Olympics. In the run-up, the government lifted many long-standing restrictions on the movements and activities of foreign correspondents. But in the wake of the games, China's domestic political climate and its external behavior began to change. The financial crisis that rocked the West in 2008 and 2009 convinced China's leaders that the US was a declining power and that the time was right for Beijing to show a more assertive face to the rest of the world. And that included its treatment of the foreign media. For reporters, covering China became an increasingly tense game of cat and mouse with the authorities, a dynamic which became steadily nastier as Xi Jinping became increasingly powerful and began to roll back some of the reform policies of previous years, as well as in making himself, in effect, emperor for life. Yet American correspondents managed, nonetheless, to do some remarkable work. This included the expose by Mike Forsyth of Bloomberg News about the hidden wealth of Xi Jinping's relatives, and David Barbosa's Pulitzer Prize winning reporting about the hidden wealth of the relatives of Premier Wen Jiabao. It's interesting to hear Barbosa talk about how he reported the story. 
Of course, there's also been the terrific work of many journalists to expose the campaign of repression against the Muslim Uyghur population in Xinjiang, which helped make the Xinjiang situation into a major international issue. But one consequence of the tightening under Xi Jinping is that high-level Chinese politics, which are always opaque, secretive, and a challenge to figure out, have become even more so. Indeed, there's a kind of irony that even though China, in many respects, is more accessible today than in the Mao years, see and other leaders travel, they meet other foreign dignitaries, they even address organizations like the World Economic Forum in Davos. Our knowledge of the inner working the, at the pinnacle of power in China is arguably less than in Mao's times, and conditions for reporters have continued to deteriorate. In 2019, just before COVID, the Foreign Correspondence Club of China released its annual report in which 82% of the correspondents surveyed said they experienced harassment, interference, or violence while reporting. 70% said they had interviews that they'd set up canceled due to the actions of Chinese authorities. Access shrank further during the early days of the pandemic when nearly 20 journalists for the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal were expelled. Beijing justified the expulsions as a response to a decision by the Trump administration to cap the number of staff for state of state-run Chinese media outlets in the U.S. But the move decimated the U.S. press corps in China. With just a handful of reporters there now, that has largely meant having to cover China from the outside. Ironically, the arc of the story recounted in Assignment China has almost it's kind of come full circle, because we're back to a sort of modern-day version of the art of China watching that emerged in Hong Kong in the 1950s. The central element, still involves plowing through the state-run media, trying to decipher the real meaning behind the rhetoric, jargon, slogans, symbols, obscure historical references, and dubious statistics pumped out by the Communist Party. But today, unlike years past, there are new tools and resources. These include monitoring the Chinese internet, which despite censorship can still provide critical insights. One recent example is this New York Times piece it collected the obituaries that had been publicly posted online since January 2019 on the websites of the Chinese Academy of Engineering and the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and discovered that while there were usually three or four obituaries every month, once the Chinese government abandoned its zero COVID policy last December, the number of obituaries shot up dramatically. It was terrific reporting and provided powerful evidence that the government's official death toll didn't match a much grimmer reality. Indeed, there are now a host of new online publications devoted to following the Chinese internet and the Chinese media more broadly, and I'm sure you know most of them. They include, among others, What's on Weibo, run by a Dutch uh, China specialist, which charts what appears on the Chinese version of Twitter. There's Cynicism, run by American China expert Bill Bishop, which offers summaries, analysis, and links to major Chinese media stories and the Chinese Media Project, which does something similar. There's also commercially available satellite imagery, which was used to uncover the uh, evidence of the camps in Xinjiang, and that's become increasingly important. More recently, reporters used satellite images to document unusually high activity at crematoriums across China. This was a picture taken um, uh, of a crematorium near Beijing. And if you look on, on the right-hand side, you see a lot of cars in the parking lot, and you look on the left-hand side, and it's almost empty. The difference is that picture was taken on the left in early December. This picture was taken at the end of December, and it's yet another example of the high death toll that the government didn't acknowledge due to its abandonment of the zero COVID policy. Moreover, China's growing international involvement is also providing opportunities for reporters. One recent example was this long Wall Street Journal piece about problems in many high-profile Chinese uh, construction projects that are part of the much publicized Belt and Road Initiative. The journal reporters talk to people in Peru, Pakistan, Uganda, Angola, and elsewhere. Interestingly, though, although they requested comment from Chinese uh, embassies, companies, and the central government, no one was going <laughs> to speak with them. There are countless other similar cases correspondents trying to get the Chinese perspective, but being routinely rebuffed. Another example of how China goes out of its way to make it hard for foreign journalists. Perhaps the most unfortunate consequence of the sharp drop in American and other foreign media access to China 
is the ability of reporters to go around the country, talk to people, to witness for themselves what is going on has been severely limited. Being there is the essential foundation for good journalism, and that's become harder and harder to do. In addition, even when travel is possible, reporters also face a populace who, after years of being told by uh, state media that foreign journalists are spies, are often reluctant to talk, if not downright hostile. The upshot is that journalists are less able to convey the richness and complexity and humanity of the world's most populous nation. And I think that's something that is increasingly important to do, especially now at a time of growing tension between China and the United States. So Bill said I could only go for 20 minutes, and even with the technical glitches, I think that's about 20. So let me stop there. Uh, thanks for your attention, and uh, we'll open up for questions in the